Well, good morning. Uh, this is Sunday Sermon for March 21st, 2021. It's taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, a little longer passage, 4 through 12. And the title of, of my message this morning is The Construction Project. Now, just a, a brief review. Last time, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we began in verses 1 through 3. And, and we looked at those things that hinder unity being built together, uh, brethren. You know, we need to get rid of, get rid of, or we said just stop it, you know, malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, you know, rather crave the word of God and grow up, mature, taste the Lord, you know, and see that he is good. And now by way of introduction, Peter, having, having preached to us what not to be and how we need to grow up and just quit it and how we need to be nourished uh, by the craving of the Word of God, he tells us now in this passage also because we are part of a construction project. God is fitting us together in this grand uh, construction project that he has taken on. In the midst of their persecution, in the midst of their being scattered, uh, in, 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 in the midst of, of the, the terrible uh, sin uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of the world that they were living in, the Roman world at that period of time, God is calling out a people, a special people, and assembling them together. And we're to lay aside everything that would hinder that, and he is building us up for himself. So let's read that beautiful text with that in mind of where Peter has taken us to bring us to this point to tell us part of the reason that we are to do all of this is because of who we are and we are part of God's construction project. So as you come to him, and again, remember in those first uh, ch uh, chapter one and chapter two, verses one through three, being you know purified by opening your life up to him, uh, by putting off those, those terrible uh, old manner of life, those sins, and putting on the new way of life of love. He says, so as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones. You see, they may have been rejected by men too and were being rejected. But you also, just like him, you see, you also, like living stones, you are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Doesn't matter. He became the capstone anyway. Whether you accept him or you reject him, he's the head. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He holds it all, all together. It says, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and the stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. You see, you either come to that rock and are saved or you come to that rock and stumble over it and fall. They stumbled because they disobeyed the message, which is also what they were destined for in God's plan. The falling away of the, the Jewish nation was the creation of a whole new nation called the church. No longer Jew or Gentile. But God has taken two and made one new nation, tearing down the middle wall of partition, the church. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The stone that can't that causes men to stumble uh, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That's who you are, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, you know, you heathen, you Gentiles. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul because God's got bigger plans for you in his construction project. So quit fooling around, like he said earlier. Mature, grow up. 
live such good lives among the pagans. See, you used to be a pagan. God saved you from that. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, lying about you behind your back, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he bids us. Now let's let's break this down a little bit this morning. Uh, again, living stones. So as you come to him, first point, the living stones rejected by men. Remember, they cried, crucify him, uh, crucify him. Trying to fix this camera here a little bit. There we go. They cried, crucify him, crucify him. They were rejected by men, but nonetheless, he was chosen by God and he was precious to him. You also, me and you, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, God's construction project. That's who you are. That's what God is doing with you in this world. And you are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices. You know, that reminds me again of Romans 12, 1 and 2. By the mercies of God, you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. As you submit to him because you love him, as you give your ear to be a bond slave to him, to willingly desire to serve him. Because that's what God wants. He wants your love. He wants your submission, not your subjection. I'll do it, but I don't like doing it. No, we do it because we love him. And that's what God wants. He's building this great construction project. Acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in him the scripture says, and this is a quote from Isaiah 28 and verse 16. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious cornerstone. And that's where they would lay everything off the cornerstone as far as level and perpendicular walls, a cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone anyway. Now, capstone's a little different, but it's that stone that holds everything together. I think in the Roman archways, uh, of which they were famous in their aqueducts and, and bridges, that they had learned the stonemason, there's a keystone. The very stone at the top, which is specially uh, a cut, it holds that whole arch together. You pull the keystone out, the thing collapses. That's like Jesus. He's that keystone. He's that capstone. Even though they rejected him and stumbled over him and their whole world collapsed, but he's our keystone. God made him the keystone anyway. He made him the capstone anyway. The stone the builders rejected, the nation of Israel, has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Isaiah 8 and verse 14 is where that's from. But you come to Jesus, you either accept him or reject him. He either becomes your salvation or your damnation. He either lifts you up and puts you on the rock, or you find yourself in a slimy pit destined for hell. They stumbled because they disobeyed the message which is also what they were destined for. And God's plan uh, for knowing how, what would happen in their rejection of Jesus Christ, who wasn't the kind of king they wanted. He wasn't ushering in the kind of kingdom that they wanted. I mean, he, he hung around with tax collectors and sinners. He even touched a leper. They stumbled because they disobeyed the message. The message was clear. The message is there in Scripture if they would have sought it. The message, which also, it's what they were they were destined, destined for. We are in in the middle of an ongoing construction project. That's who you are. It's not a construction project of brick and mortar and sand and cement or lime. But you are living stones, and God is shaping your life to fit in that wall. The stones in the wall of his temple, it's you, and it's me, his church. We are priests, 
that he's putting in this wall. Priests who continually offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. A temple of worship. That's his, con his construction project. Worship all lifting him up. Testifying to his great salvation. Extolling him. Praising and thanksgiving with prayer. Waiting and resting in Him. And for the day when He comes to get us. Loving Him. Submitting to Him. Holy priests. Continually offering worship and sacrifices to God. You know, the most uh, uh, profound teaching on worship that is found in the Bible is Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. Very unusual for a rabbi to address a woman, let alone a Samaritan woman. Uh, they were considered, you know, cultists in Jesus' day. There are no limits on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there are no limits on his grace. And he taught more about worship to her is the most profound passage on worship to a pagan Samaritan woman. And there in John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24, and again, that camera just keeps going up. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. doesn't matter where you worship God. It's not where you worship God. It's how you worship Him. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. They laid that foundation, right? Jesus came a Jew born of, of the lineage of David. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seek. God is a spirit and His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth, it is a spiritual temple made up of living stones who are priests who continually offer the sacrifice of love and praise to God. One of the things, too, I think that priests did in the Old Testament, as we make that parallel, is they interceded uh, to God on behalf of people as we pray for our world to get saved. Our neighbors, our friends, interceding on their behalf as priests coming to God as a holy priesthood. 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 7, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. You're God's construction project of worshipers, of priests, to worship before Him continually. To offer spiritual sacrifices. That's what God wants. Sacrifices of truth. True sacrifice. Second Corinthians 6.16 6, We read, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. You are the temple of God. You are God's construction project. Live like it. Ephesians 2, 20 and 21. Built on the foundation of the apostles. He came and preached to us of what they had witnessed and testified to us about Jesus, who is the Christ. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. And this was written to fulfill what the prophets said. All the law and the prophets, Jesus said, write about me built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone by which everything else is laid out. And he ties it all together as a keystone. In him, the whole building is being joined together as it rises to be a holy temple to the Lord that we might worship him. We don't worship him in buildings of of stone, of a brick and mortar, uh, or wood and nails, or stucco and steel. We worship in spirit and in truth. It's not that we go 
somewhere to worship God, we are that temple that God is worshipped in. If we understand what Jesus was saying to the Samaritan woman, it's not where you worship God. It's how you worship Him. Early church father Ignatius of Antioch, he wrote in about the year 110 A.D., uh, not far, receiving the testimony that maybe he knew some of the apostles. Maybe he was uh, one to the Lord, like Polycarp supposedly was one to the Lord by the Apostle John. But he's that next generation, you know, of, of, of as the apostles were dying out, this next generation that took up the cross and took up the testimony. And, and Ignatius of Antioch wrote in AD 110, and I quote, he says, You are stones of a temple prepared beforehand for the building of God the Father. Hoisted up to the heights by the crane of Jesus Christ, which is the cross, using the rope of the Holy Spirit. That's a beautiful picture. He pictured the cross poetically as a crane with the Holy Spirit rope that picks us stones up as we are saved and born again by the Holy Spirit of God through the blood of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, who lifts us up and puts us in the wall. By the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. And not only that, you're a priesthood of royal priests to continually worship in awe and praise God and testify to His great and mighty deeds. Secondly, you're a chosen nation. But you are not only this, this, this temple, this construction project, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people belonging to God that you may declare, that's why you were born again, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of the darkness of this whole world into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, you pagans, you Gentiles, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now... You have received mercy. You got something to sing about. Something to shout about. Something to witness and testify to others about. You are chosen. You know, the idea of a royal priesthood is you are the private, personal priest of the king. You're not just any old priest. You're royal priests. You're the king's priests. To minister before him. You're a holy nation. A set-apart nation. A kingdom within a kingdom. That's why you're pilgrims and strangers here. Uh, this world, we're not citizens of this world. We're just a passing through. Our citizenship is in heaven, the kingdom that we serve. That kingdom that we pray every day, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A holy nation, a chosen nation of royal priests declaring his praises who called you out of darkness to let your little light, your little light shine. A little side note here: What uh, in the old, what what uh, in the Old Testament uh, do you remember reading about this? Well, again, it's it's true of the nation of Israel as well as this new nation that is founded upon that root uh, that was grafted in uh, the the church, but the foundation goes back to the nation of Israel who laid the foundation, but they would stumble over the cornerstone, the keystone. And all of us pagans would be grafted in. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, For you are, he told the nation of Israel, uh, uh, the peop uh, people holy to the Lord, your God, set apart unto him. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord didn't set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people. Or some translation, because you were greater than other people. And that greater many times refers to numbers, but not necessarily. It was, he didn't do it because the Jews were a great nation. They were the least of all the nations. Doesn't God always delight in taking that which is least? And by his power making it great? He chooses the least and last and the servants of all. He chooses the meek. Because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest or the least of all the peoples of the earth. But it was because the Lord loved you. 
He set his affection on you. It was all of grace. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't merit it. It wasn't because you were great. It was because you were least. It was because he loved you. And he kept the oath he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham. Remember that in Abraham, not just the nation of Israel would get saved, but all nations would be blessed through Abraham. That was the promise. He says, and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand out of Egypt and he redeemed you. Remember the Passover lamb from the land of slavery. The blood sprinkled on the doorpost from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And again, all a mighty picture of Christ's cross and how he redeemed us out of an even greater bondage than the Pharaoh of Egypt, out of the bondage of sin in which we were sold into and enslaved. Romans 11 is a commentary on this. Romans 11, uh, verses 11 through 24 of chapter 11. Again, I ask, Paul says, did they stumble, that's the nation of Israel, so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their sin, their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, you pagans, to make Israel envious. For if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles and as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in hope that I may somehow arouse my own people, the Jews, to envy and to save some of them. Remember the hardness is set in on them and they rejected and stumbled over that capstone. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as fruit, first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, and that's what I like to think of Gentiles, I got my black leather jacket and I put the, we're, we're wild olives. Okay? We're rebels. But God chose to save the wild olives and to graft them into that holy root. Do not, he says, says, if some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from that olive root abiding in Christ, don't boast over those branches. Don't boast over the nation of Israel, the Jews, who have been set aside, who rejected Jesus, that cornerstone. He says, don't boast over them. Do not boast over those branches. If you do, Consider this, church, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You were built upon that root. Your continuation of God's plan that he foresaw from the beginning, built upon that root of the prophets. Do not be arrogant. Oh, well, let me come back. You will say then, he says, you do not support the root, the root supports you. You will say then, well, the branches were broken off so I could be grafted in. True, granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. Paul is putting some old time fear of God in the Roman church. Don't get cocky. Don't think you're so special. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Learn all those things that happened in the Old Testament were written as examples for us that we wouldn't follow in their ways. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and the severity of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness, in that grace in that love. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Don't get cocky. And if they did not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted, be grafted in to their own, to their own olive tree. Thirdly, so glorify God. If you understand what God has done for you, 
especially you pagans. Glorify God. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires. We talked about those in chapter 1 quite a bit. Abstain from those things. Quit it. They war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, I think of the Romans, that even though you live in, 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 in an ungodly nation who is persecuting you, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they lie about you, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You know, Peter, again, emphasizing uh, what he had, had told us to others. How do you overcome evil? By doing good. And even though they lie about you, I remember reading a story about how the Romans had some soldiers go undercover in the catacombs in Rome. And they would go down in the catacombs to see what these Christians are doing. And they went down in the catacombs, and I remember the report, it's in one of F.F. F. Bruce's books on the New Testament. And, and they had uh, listened in, tried to listen in these catacombs that echo what these Christians were saying. Well, after they listened in on a church service somewhere in the catacombs, remember that's where they buried bodies. You know, the, the walls had, had crypts stuck out in them and there were dead bodies in them. They went back and they reported to the emperor uh, at that time. They said, they're cannibals. We heard them. I mean, they're down there in the catacombs with all these and they're eating flesh and they're drinking blood. What they had probably overheard was a communion service. And they lied about them. You know, there are a bunch of cannibals down there in the, in the catacombs with all them dead bodies. Peter says, but live such good lives among the pagans though they accuse you of doing wrong even to being cannibals they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day he visits us again your life is the verification of the truth that you proclaim live such good lives that as you testify to christ and his grace to you they'll have a hard time with that offering yourself uh, in acceptable worship to God as you submit to him and do what good you can in this old world until it says they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us and listen he's coming again he's coming again perhaps today this 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 Sunday may not end before our Lord comes back for us in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 through 16, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others hospitality, uh, kindness to aliens, foreigners, and strangers, and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God, is pleased. That's what pleases God. And as a holy priesthood, those are the sacrifices that God would have us to offer to him. In conclusion, you are a part of God's great construction project. You are living stones. You are a spiritual house, his temple. You are a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. You are a royal priesthood, a, a priesthood of kings and princes, his own personal priests. You are a chosen people. He set his affection, his love on you. You are a holy nation. You are aliens and strangers in this world declaring or testifying to his mercies, giving him praises, and doing what good you can in an old sinful world full of tribulations till he comes again. And he's coming again. And all of this is all of grace. You wild olives, you don't deserve it. You don't merit it. You don't deserve it. But God chose you in Christ before the foundations of the world. And all you need to do is to agree with God that you're a sinner. We are so broken, so pig-headed, so prideful because of the fall, strutting around like little gods. Give it up. Give in. Agree with God that I'm a miserable sinner. Accept it. Own your sins. And then believe. Believe that God did for you what he said he did for you. He didn't lie. 
He sent his very own son. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, including you, believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's a gift with empty, open hands of faith. Just accept his free gift and believe it. And then the C of the ABCs of eternal life is confess him as Lord. Lord of Lords, King of Kings, building his temple out of folks that love him and have submitted to him and who have believed, believe the gospel. Think on these things. Great passage of scripture. Because of time, we only have a little bit to get into it. There's a lot more there for you to study. All right. God bless. Till we see you next time. Peace. Thank you.